first steps in functional programming begin with values, expressions, types, and functions. What exactly is functional programming? It is a paradigm of programming. It is a whole approach to writing code. There are several paradigms of programming, such as imperative, object-oriented, functional, logic programming, and constraint programming. Functional programming is unique among all these because it treats programs as mathematical expressions. And mathematical intuition actually helps you write code and design your program. With all other paradigms, it's a different kind of intuition that you need, and uh, functional programming is superior because mathematical intuition is so much more developed. It has literally thousands of years of mathematical experience behind it. There are several programming languages that support functional programming. Some of them were designed specifically for very advanced functional programming, such as Haskell and OCaml. Other languages were less advanced and more pragmatic. Scala is on the advanced side. F Sharp and Swift are less advanced, more uh, pragmatic. Um, all of the last three languages, F Sharp, Scala, and Swift, support object-oriented programming as well. OCaml supports object-oriented programming as well. However, languages such as C, C++, JavaScript, Java, and Python do not support functional programming well. They do support object-oriented and imperative programming, but not functional. It is important that the language should support functional programming because it's otherwise it's just too difficult to use for practical projects. In this tutorial, we will be using Scala. However, other functional languages, OCaml, Haskell, and so on, are essentially so similar at this level that I could easily imagine doing exactly the same thing in all those other languages. We will not be using, at least in the initial tutorials, any advanced features that make Haskell or F Sharp or OCaml so different from each other. Here's what Scala looks like. This is a program in Scala that prints a message. First, note there's the main function. Um, the main function computes values. So val is a declaration of a value or constant. Um, compute message is a function. It returns a string. Compute number returns an integer. So we print message and number as a single string. Let me run this. I'm running this in IntelliJ, so uh, you'll see it's compiling the program now. And this is the result. Hello, 123. Here are some more examples of functional programs. I, be I begin by writing actual mathematical formulas for computations. So for example, to compute the factorial of a natural number, we write a formula like this. 
and to check whether a given number n is prime, we write something like this, which looks like text, but actually it is a formula. It has a very well-defined part here, for example, that says from which set to choose the, the number i, and then there's a predicate that says that some condition must be true for all i, and so on. So mathematics has developed over centuries notation and language to talk about formulas and computations. And so, for instance, to count how many even numbers a given set S contains, we would say something like this. We would create a function that returns 0 or 1, um, depending on whether k is even. And then we will sum over all k from the set S of the values of this function. So these are formulas typical in mathematics. And functional languages allow you to write pro programs more or less exactly in the same way. I will now show you how I would write a Scala program for each of these examples. I will use something called a Scala worksheet. for this demonstration. So let us begin with the first one. Compute the factorial of a natural number. So I need to take a product of the numbers from 1 to n. So in Scala, I would say, let me say this is uh, factorial of 10. So how would I compute that? I will take the set of numbers from 1 to n, in this case n is 10, and take the product of this set. n is undefined, let me just put 10 in here. All right. The development editor that I'm using is IntelliJ, and it computes immediately what I have done. Now I can make a function, which is written like this. So define a function from integer to integer. I would write the same code. And then I can say val f10 equals, equals factorial 10. And I get the same result. Let us look at the second example. We check whether natural number is a prime. So let's define a function prime that basically reproduces this computation. Prime will return boolean. Now, the computation looks like this, okay? So I will just make a comment to remind me what I'm going to implement now. So I start with this set of numbers or sequence of numbers from 2 to n. So n is not included in the range, 2 is included 
in the range. So this is expressed in Scala as 2 until n. So note the difference between 1 to n, which is a range with included n, and 2 until n does not include n. So it's red because, as it says, the expression does not have the type boolean. Well, I'm not yet finished writing. That's why. So that's fine. All right, so for all i from this from this range, I need the condition to hold. See, for it, it prompts me that for all is a, is a known method, and it has an argument, which is a function from integer to boolean. So I will explain how that works, but for now, let me just write this. So p uh, is a predicate. Now let me say just i goes to So n must be not divisible by i. So n modulo i must be not equal to 0. Looks like we're done. So is, is uh, 13 a prime? Yes, that is true. What about 12? False. Seems to be working. Now, notice how similar that is. So the um, order of expressions is a little different. I don't, I don't start by saying for all i. But I say this range must satisfy a condition that for all i from this range, this is true. This is pretty much the same as this, and this is pretty much the same as the factorial. So I'm really writing down mathematical text here. I'm writing mathematical formulas, and these formulas become programs. Last example is that I can copy this actually. I can't copy very well. Um, starting a comment. All right, this is a bit hard to read because of the special symbols. All right, so we want to define a function, count even, uh, which is a function of a set of integers. Now Scala has sets for sure. Let's define a function, count even, where s is a set of integers. And the result of that function is a number, so it's integer. See, I need to write down the type of the function's result and the type of the function's argument. So that's, uh, in Scala, that is almost always required, and it's good practice. Um, but it is not necessary to write types for vowels. They're usually uh, automatically determined. All right, so how do we do count even? Well, we need this function is even, so we can define it. Function that returns integer, it returns one if k is divisible by two. So let me write that if, uh, let me start on a new line. 
if k is divisible by 2, then 1 is 0. Now, I have written this bracket here. If that is 1, then it, otherwise it's 0. And now I have this sum over OK of is even. Well, sum can be um, computed if we compute a sequence of all values is even of K. So let's con convert SS set to a sequence, which is this function it prompts me to use. Then I say map, I need to, for each element of the sequence, I need to compute is even. Now that gets me a sequence of integers, which the editor tells me. I need to add all that. So that's this method called dot sum. So let us see. Count even, count even, set of one, two, three, four, five. Two. This is correct. Now if you look at this code, this code has a definition of a function and then there is a mathematical formula. This formula is exactly as the same as this. A sum over all k from the set of a sequence that is obtained if you take each k and evaluate is even on that k. Now, in mathematics, the sequence is implicit. We don't say take the sequence. We just say sum over this. But actually what we mean is that we need to make a sequence of these values. We need to compute each of these values and add them. So in Scala, this is explicit. You make a sequence, then you uh, the map method I will talk about a little later, it transforms the sequence, applies a function to each element of the sequence, and the result is a, is a new sequence of transformed values. Now, usually programs in Java or Python are not at all similar to the mathematical expressions. I just wanted to point out, I was able to write code basically by translating mathematical expressions into Scala. This is not the case for non-functional languages. Well, let us go look back at that code. Um, as I demonstrated, the code represents a mathematical expression of course, using Scala conventions and Scala syntax, uh, and certain things need to be spelled out in Scala that a mathematical notation doesn't spell out, but more or less that's just an expression. Each value I defined is immutable and has a fixed type. You see here, this is a value which is this. There's no no way to change that value. And there, this, this is really, f10 is just a name for this number. So it makes very little sense to say that we want to change now this number. This number cannot change. It's, it's a number. Functions also cannot change their argument or anything. Uh, they're fixed, so they just denote this expression. So this prime is a name of a function and this function just is a short notation for this expression. There's nothing else. There's no way to change that function or 
make a new expression with change n in it or change i in it. There's no way to do that. This is fixed. The code defines new names or new functions within, within an expression, like in, in this example. This is still one expression. So this expression can be read more or less um, as we read mathematical text. Like define is even like this, and then this is the result. So count even is defined like this. So this is conceptually still one mathematical formula, although it is split into parts. But in mathematics, often we define names for things just to make things sh sh formulas shorter. Note we do not have any loops, we don't have any go to or repeat operations. Um, and this is again just like in a mathematical text. Um, have you ever seen a text in mathematics that would tell you, oh, if right now if k is greater than 10, then go to equation 123 and repeat that, uh, or change k to k minus 1, or uh, now set x to 0 and go back to such and such page and read it again. No math book would ever say that. Uh, it would be very confusing if, if it did. Uh, so functional programming learns that lesson. We do not have loops, we do not use go to, and we do not repeat. What would it mean to repeat? And mathematically it's meaningless. Uh, let me say x is a solution of some equation. There's no need to repeat anything. It's a solution, so it needs to be computed, maybe, and that's it. Uh, there's no possible usefulness in saying, oh, now we repeat that equation. So in functional programming, this is not necessary. We don't repeat things. We don't make loops or go throughs, or also we don't mutate anything. Now this is um, basically uh, the uh, principle that we're trying to use in functional programming. following mathematical tradition. So in, ma in the mathematical tradition, there are two kinds of variables. There's uh, named constants and there are function arguments. So in Scala, uh, this is how you would write that. So this is a named constant and this is a function. So a function with name f has arguments x and y, so these names x and y are what we call variables in mathematics, but they are actually not mutable, so no mathematical function will try to change the value of x. x is the value given as an argument of the function, so you can compute something out of it, that's all you ever do. So let's do, the, so Scala does the same, so vals are immutable, function arguments are immutable. You cannot change x and it makes no sense to do that. Moreover, each value has a fixed type, so for example here it's an integer. This a is also an integer. You don't have to write that, you could. Let me demonstrate uh, how I would do that, I would say val a int equals zero. I can do this, but uh, this is not necessary. This is zero is already clear that this is an integer. Now, if I say something like this, you see, it tells me there's an error because types do not match. I said that a must be integer and then I 
put a string in here. So that does not work. If I get rid of this, that's fine. Um, A is now of type string. IntelliJ can show me what the type is. There is a key combination for that. So basically, this is just to say that every value must have a fixed type. The type is fixed when you define that value. Either that value is defined like this, then the type is fixed, or it's a function argument, and then the type is fixed here. Now, for function arguments, it is particularly obvious what type means. It is the set of possible values of that argument. So, for instance, here in this function, x and y must be integers. So, x and y range over the set, uh, all the possible integer values. The type of x is the set of all integer values. That's to say the same thing. Um, and as I said, type is automatically assigned to named constants when you say val. So you don't need to say type in it. But you can, in case you're not sure. In some cases, types are complex, complicated, and then it helps to write down the type. And then you can catch some errors early. These are example types, integer, boolean, array of strings. There are many types. The type system of Scala is very flexible. And we will be seeing more types. Now, there are two ways of defining a function, actually, which we have already seen in the test code. But let me go more systematically about it. The first way is the named function. It's also called method. Now, this is terminology used in object-oriented programming. Um, but it's just the same in Scala as a function with a name. So you need to say def, and then you say name, like, like this. And then you have your arguments one or more, or maybe no arguments. You can have functions with no arguments as well. Um, and then you say what type the result must be of this function. And then you declare a code for this function. You can write the code in braces, in curly brackets, or you can write it, if it's very simple, if it's just one line, you don't need the brackets. You can write them without brackets, as I have seen, as, as I have done um, here. See, I did not write any, any brackets, um, and that's fine. A very simple function. Um, I could do this. It's now a function with no arguments, and this is still okay with the Scala compiler. The second way of writing a function in Scala is anonymous, without a name. Now, mathematically, functions are mappings from one set to another. It is not necessary for them to have a name. Maybe we just have one function used at one place. Why do we need a name for it? Um, in mathematics, Almost always people write names for functions, but this is well, this is not always useful and not necessary. So, in fact, anonymous functions are very important in functional programming. Um, they make things much faster to write, uh, much less code also. Here's an example. This is a function. Um, which is equivalent to this one. It takes x and y and returns the same expression. But notice we have written this function like this as an expression. So this is actually a value. Let me copy this and paste it over there. 
let me call this f1. I can just paste this thing. And you see it will say f1 has type like this. And the value of f1 is this. Now, this whole thing is, of course, uh, um, not what I wrote here. This is compiled code. Uh, the value of the function is compiled code that can compute this thing when necessary. So that's why we cannot print it really. Um, this is the name of some pointer in memory maybe, I don't know. But we won't care about that so much as we care about the type. Now look at this type. This is the type that says the function that takes two integers and returns an integer and we can use it for example like this I expect uh, 25 here yes um, just like a normal function we can use it very important detail here is that functions defined without names or anonymous functions are values just like this is a string value this is a function value this this value means the function as such it is not yet applied to any arguments it is waiting to be applied so f1 is waiting to be applied but it's a value I can put it into some array or whatever I can say well c equals f1 Sure, so f1 is a value, now I have defined another, another value c, which is going to be exactly the same. So you see we can deal with functions, if we define functions anonymously like this, without names, it's very easy to deal with functions as values. This is a very important concept in functional programming that is usually not emphasized in other paradigms of programming uh, in object-oriented programming or in imperative programming it's not emphasized that functions can be treated as values but indeed they are values they are immutable we cannot change this this is a function it computes square a sum of squares we cannot change it there's once you define it that's it just like a value, it has a fixed type, can be assigned a name, can be used later in some expressions, or it can be used directly as an argument of a function. So here is an example, which we have kind of seen before in my demonstration, where I have a range of integers from 1 to 10, and I apply a function to each of these integers and I get a range transformed like this. Let me run this. What would I get? Well, I get a vector of squares of numbers indeed. So this range is automatically transformed into a vector when I do this. Well, we'll see more of this. So what exactly is this 1 to 10? Let's check if this is really true. Yeah, now notice there's an indexed sequence vector. There are all these types. They're all different. Scala, collection, immutable, range, inclusive. So there's a Remember, I, we, we had the range that included, so 1 to 10 is included, 1 until 10 does not include. 1 until 10 does not include 10, so that would be a range that is not inclusive. Um, so all these types are defined in the Scala standard library, index, sequence, vector, this is all in the standard library. Um, these are all 
different types of sequences. Note also this square brackets with int. Now that I will talk about much more later, but this is a type of the element in the sequence. So sequences exist in many varieties. So there's the main type sequence, seek, and then there are subtypes, list, index seek, and so on. So for example, you can write code like this. Let me write it here. Let's see what it says now. So it says it's a list. So it shows it shows a specific um, version of sequence. There's all these different types of sequences, but for now, let's just think about them as a seek of int. Um, then there are sets. We've seen that too. Sets are different from sequences in that they're not ordered. And then if I say, for example, set of one, 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 three, the result will be just the same as a set of one, three. So the repeating elements are ignored in a set. So a set cannot have repeated elements. Um, and there's also dictionary-like type, um, which, uh, which is called map, capital M map. The lowercase m map is very different. Uh, this, is, this has nothing to do with this capital map. Um, so the dictionary type can be used like this. So it's, uh, if you're familiar with Python dictionaries, that's pretty much the same thing, except it has fixed, oops, I'm somewhere, uh, except it has fixed types. So the key in the dictionary must be of some fixed type and the value, all the values must be of some fixed type. So there cannot be some other type of key, non-string, or an other type of value that is not integer. That would give you an error. Um, so the parameterized types, um, just make a note right now. This is the syntax for them. Um, we'll talk a lot more later about parameterized types. Uh, collections can have uh, 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 type uh, parameter, which can be any type. So, um, for example, you can have a sequence of string or sequence of boolean or map of boolean and set of sequence of int or whatever. You can do you can do whatever you need um, for a particular application. For example, we, we can have a a sequence of sets. Let's say this sequence of sets. Okay, so that's fine. What is the type of that? Well, the type of that is is a seek of set of int. So um, let me check that this is so. As if it is not so, this, this will give me an error. So uh, yeah seems to be working. If I make a mistake here and I say set of A, then it doesn't work. It does not conform to expected type. So this is a useful way of checking yourself. Make sure you don't, by mistake, you don't have some values of wrong type. So here's a summary of what we have seen so far. There are these methods, map, uh, for all, there are other, other such methods like filter, exists, or many, many methods defined on, on collections. And then there are the methods like sum and product, they're defined on collections with number types. 
Um, what we have learned is sufficient to translate quite a few things from mathematics into Scala code. Uh, we can have a mathematical expression with sums, products, with quantifiers, and we can translate that into Scala. Now, one interesting thing that we need to do when we do that is that sometimes we need to introduce explicit sequences or sets where mathematical notation seems to be not talking about sets or sequences uh, explicitly. So, for example, here, um, Um, for example, here, um, this notation does not show that we're actually taking a sequence from 1 to n. Well, this notation is more terse. And also, this notation does not use any functions. You see this k here is actually the same k as this. Um, and in fact, what happens here is that this k squared is an anonymous function that takes k and computes k squared. This is more apparent in the next line when I have a function f of k and I have a product of f of k for these k's. Now if I write k squared here, it looks like I haven't, I haven't written any function f, but actually mathematical notation is implicitly telling me that this is k squared, where k is this k that goes from 1 to n. So actually, this is an anonymous function. Um, in Scala, this has to be explicit. So uh, you have to say map and then write the anonymous function. Um, but it turns out these anonymous functions make everything very easy to uh, e easy to encode. So you can encode uh, all kinds of statements like this. For example, let's make a sum over all k from a set S such that p of k holds, and then we have f of k. Then basically we just say this, set S, filter p, and that deletes all elements for which the predicate p not, does not hold. And then we map over f and then we do a sum. So, so this basically translates one-to-one -one mathematical formula into a program. Um, note that um, in mathematical notation, uh, derivatives and integrals um, are special notation. They're just like the sum or product but, in fact, they can be thought of as functions or mappings from one function to another. And so a derivative is a, fun a mapping from function to function. Uh, an integral is a mapping from function and range of integration to a number. Um, in functional programming, uh, the terminology is to call them higher order functions. So higher order functions are functions that take function type arguments and or return function type values. So a derivative is a typical higher order function. If you imagine uh, take a, a sine function and the der derivative of that is cosine and so that's uh, a typical higher order function. Um, so, as we have just seen, um, computations with sequences, sets, um, and so on can be done very concisely and pretty much error-free because it's obvious what you're doing. There's no way to miss some elements um, with uh, these higher order functions like map, uh, filter, and there are many, many others in Scala, like size, reduce, uh, concatenate, find. Uh, we will look at them later. Right now, just uh, take note that there are lots of these functions, lots of these methods, 
that are higher order functions that are very useful and you can write code very concisely. So you write code in the functional paradigm by essentially thinking about your computation as a mathematical formula. Of course, your computation is going to be much more complicated than these examples here. So you split it into parts, but each part is still a mathematical formula. And that's um, how you do uh, programming in the functional paradigm. Let's look at some examples. Um, here's some simple set of examples that I will just go through quickly. Um, let's look at a function that adds 20 to its integer argument. Well, obviously the result must be integer. So we can define this function with a name, add 20 takes integer, returns integer. That is obviously n plus 20. Let's check that this is true. All right, so add 20 um, is a function. Let's define the same function as a val. Yeah, that's 120. Now, to define the same function as a val, let's have a different name. Um, we need to say that this function, no, this val, has a certain type. We don't need to necessarily write types in val, but let's do it this time. So the type is a function that takes an integer argument and returns an integer value. So that is written in Scala like this. So it's a type that takes integer and returns integer. And that is uh, the value of that function. So I first I have to say what the type is. This is the type. And the value is a function that takes integer x, say, and returns x plus 20. Now, this is a little difficult to read uh, in this syntax. So for clarity, people usually add parentheses for the type. And you can also add parentheses for the value. Now, IntelliJ says unnecessary parentheses. Yes, they're unnecessary, but they're better for clarity. And uh, actually, there is a convention that people use curly braces for, for functions rather than parentheses. Let me actually delete uh, the other stuff so that we don't have a lot of extra code. So um, let me test. And this still works. Right. So that was the first example. Now, the second example is a little more interesting. It takes an integer x and returns a function that adds x to its argument, to the argument of that function. So let's do that. Uh, so this uh, function that we're going to implement will return a new function. So let me call it make func. Now it takes an argument n, which is integer, or x, rather. Name of the argument, of course, is not important 
here I can say x, I can say n, I can say p, I can say whatever I want. IntelliJ has a function to rename things, for example, like that. It automatically, automatically will rename the function argument. I can do it like that. All right, so now this result must be a function like the function in the previous example. Now we know that the type of the function in the previous example, right, the function that adds some integer to the argument, the type is this. So that is going to be the return type of our function. So what is going to be the code of that function, the, the expression? Well, we need a function that adds x to its argument. Well, that is the function that adds x to its argument. a goes to a plus x. That's it. That's the function that we want to implement. Now, let's check that this actually works. So, for example, val f1 equals make func of 20. Right? So, we call this make func with an argument 20. And the result is, is called f1. So, it's a named constant. Now, this named constant, it tells me, has type int to int. So it's a function. Well, let's see if it works. F1 of 100. That's correct. So that's how it works. It's a function that takes arguments and returns another function. It returns this type. Um, we can define the same thing using a val instead of a def make func a, let's say, x. Now, make func a will have a type int going to int going to int. Now it's becoming a bit interesting, isn't it? Um, so that's going to be x going to a going to a plus x. Now that's really not easy to read. So let me put some parentheses here, braces, and it tells me that this is unnecessary. Well, if I delete them, I get a very interesting syntax here, x going to a going to a plus x, which could be a little hard to read if you're not used to it. What it means is really this. It takes x and returns a function, which takes a and returns a plus x. So syntax-wise, that is probably the easiest to read. But Scala does not require you to write these parentheses. And this would be exactly the same code, actually. You can check that this is so. This will be not very readable, but exactly the same thing. Let's see. Val f2 equals make func a of 20. Let's make it 40 now. f2 of 200. That's right. So, just one little comment here about functions of this kind. Now, this is a typical higher order function. Um, you see, this kind of thing occurs sometimes um, that you take a function, you take an argument, and you return a function that takes another argument. So, this is as if this arrow would be associative to the right. So it would be doing this, and not, not at all 
the same as that. Now that would actually be wrong. It won't work now. So that's very different. So that uh, arrow should be understood as an operation that's associative to the right. That's a convention. And uh, then, of course, it's still not easy to read. So I don't like to write it like this. But I actually I'm used to this already, to this arrow that's associated to the right, the function arrow. So I prefer to write it like this. And then that's fine. Let's go back. Last example takes an integer x and returns true if x plus 1 is prime. Well, this is very easy now. Let me delete this. Um, def f and int boolean. Now see it's boolean because I'm supposed to return true if x plus 1 is prime. So is prime and well let's make it x too. Ah now is prime is undefined. Let me define that. Is prime and int boolean. So remember how we defined it? Is prime is when it is not divisible by any number from 1 to n. Let me make it, since it's going to be a little longer, let me make it on a different line, on a new line, in, in, in curly brackets. 1 to n for all i. So for all i from 1 to n, n must be not divisible by i, so n modulo i not equal to 0. All right, seems to like me now. So what about f of 12? So that should be true. Huh? Also, um, f of 12 is is prime of 13. Something is wrong. What exactly is wrong? Hmm. Is prime is false. Um, oh yes, of course. I made a mistake. Instead of 1 to n, I must do 1 until n. Here's an off by one error. So that kind of error I can still make. And let me let me see if I have to rerun something. Hmm. Maybe I have to rerun this. Let's see how these worksheets actually work. No, it's still false. Ah, yes, it's 2 until n, right? It's not 1 until n. Now it's all true. So, those were my mistakes, and I just tested, and I know f of 14 would be false. So the types of these functions are printed right here. So it's integer to boolean, integer uh, to integer, and so on. Let's go to the next example. We want to compute the average of all numbers in a sequence of type seek of double. Use sum and size, but no loops. So. val s equals seek of 1.0, 2.0, That's a sequence of double, as you can see. And then we want to compute the average of these numbers. So uh, s dot sum divided by s dot size. That's what we need to do. Well, the answer is correct. 
So we can define a function that does this. So that's just the same code. Okay. Now notice the name s here. This s is the local variable defined in this function. This is not the same as this s. IntelliJ shows me that this is so. When I select this s, then these are highlighted. When I select this s, then these are highlighted. So this is another very important convention in functional programming that names are local. Variable names are local to their scope. So this is the scope of the name s, this s. And the scope of name of this s is the entire file. However, here there's a different s. Uh, for example, I could rename this to seek. IntelliJ knows what to rename and what not to rename. Now inside this scope, seek is defined. Outside the scope, seek is not defined. Oops. This is red, cannot resolve symbol. Now is the is this S defined inside here? It is. For example, I could do this. It is defined. Although I'm not using Q, uh, and it's not useful, but I could use symbols defined outside the function scope. They are visible. This is the convention in functional programming. And this is a, so especially for function arguments, it's important uh, to understand that if the function argument is s, then whatever symbol s was outside becomes invisible. So this is called local, a local scope for the symbol. So this is local inside this function body. Outside it's not visible. This s is the function argument. This s is a constant I defined over there. So I could call this average on anything else, like sequence of 1.0, uh, 2.0. When I call that, um, the argument s becomes the sequence, but that is a constant, so that cannot change. There is no problem. This s is a completely different variable from this. Now, I will um, show you how to compute this and how to compute this. I actually have prepared all this example code in files. Let me go to that file. Um, so these are the functions that we defined. I'm just defining them in a slightly different name. Example 1, example 2, and so on. You can download all this from the GitHub repository. Um, so here is the function for the Wallace product. Um, this is a little involved, but basically We, we found that we need to have a sequence from 1 to n, and for each element of the sequence, we, we have two fractions. So 2n divided by 2n minus 1, and 2n divided by 2n plus 1. So here's what we write. We take a sequence from 1 to n, and then we map. So for each element of the sequence, we produce this. 2n, so 2i, we need to this convert to double, otherwise it becomes integer and 
We'll truncate everything. So then it's 2i divided by 2i minus 1, 2i divided by 2i plus 1. The result of this first dot map of that is a sequence of these fractions. Now we need to take a product of all of them. So that's the result. I also have tests, but uh, well, let's look at tests later. Um, the tests call this function on some argument and um, see that the result is close to pi divided by 2. Now we can run this. Where's my worksheet? I don't know where it is. Okay, anyway. And finally, the last example is that you take a sequence of sets and you need to compute the sequence that contains those sets that are of size at least 3. So we say the function takes a sequence of sets, returns again a sequence of sets, and the code is very simple. We filter the sequence by a function. So the filter means you take only those elements of the sequence for which this function returns true. Now those will be the sets so this t is of type set of integer and for each of those t we check that the size is greater than 3. So that's the entire computation. So let me define, let me paste here the Wallace product and then call this uh, on some large number, like 10,000. And according to the definition, sorry, according to the uh, theorem that is proved in mathematics, um, this should be close to pi over 2 because uh, the limit at very, for, for n going to infinity is pi over 2. Let's check if this is pi over 2. If this is so, then cosine of this should be very small. Let's see what that, what that is. Yeah, it is 3.9 uh, times 10 to the minus 5. So this is a very small number indeed. Seems to work. Let's um, Um, test the other one. Let's test this one. Here's how we would test. We would give it a sequence of some sets. For example, set of 1, 2, 3. Set of 1. Uh, set of 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, two of them have size at least 3, so you see those remain in the result. The result is a list of these two sets. So this set was removed from the list. So this seems to work. All right, um, to summarize, we can solve using the tools we just learned quite a range of mathematical problems or programming problems. Anything that involves sums, products, quantifiers that are based on integer ranges. For example, a sum of some over some integer range of a function. We can implement functions that take functions as arguments or return other functions. These are called higher order functions. 
and we can work on collections using map, filter, size, sum, product, and other such methods. Now, certainly we are not able to solve certain other problems. For example, we cannot compute the smallest n such that an iteration of a function f, a given function f, on some number it becomes large, larger than a thousand. Now there's no way for us to express this using map, for instance. Uh, there is no way to solve problems like finding kth largest element of an array or performing a binary search. And the reason we can't solve that is because all these problems require uh, recursion or mathematical induction. So mathematical induction is the mathematical um, formulation of a recursive computation. So something like we need to apply function f unknown number of times to something and uh, or we go through an, an array and we don't know what we will find so we have to go through it um, this is uh, until we find something now there are various functions that you can use to avoid uh, writing loops and, but uh, essentially we will look at it later. Essentially, what you need is mathematical induction. And mathematical induction uh, corresponds to recursive functions in the code. So we'll look at this um, in later tutorials. Here are some exercises for you. Uh, write Scala code that implements these functions. That concludes the first tutorial.